So they don't have anything with Russia. There's no collusion. So now they go and morph into, let's inspect every deal he's ever done. We're going to go into his finances. We're going to check his deals. We're going to check. These people are sick. Unfortunately, you put the wrong people in a couple of positions, and they leave people for a long time that shouldn't be there. And all of a sudden, they're trying to take you out with now, there's a beep there for President Trump. Two hours plus yesterday, the, his longest speech ever, perhaps the longest speech ever by an American president. Uh, caps a tumultuous week here for the president and the country. We want to bring in our roundtable now, Chief Political Analyst Matthew Dowd. GOP strategist Sarah Fagan was a political director in the George W. Bush White House. Our Chief National Affairs Correspondent Tom Yamas. Maggie Haberman, White House Correspondent for the New York Times, part of the team that broke that big story this week on Jared Kushner's security clearance. And Michael Tomaski, columnist for the Daily Beast, author of the, new, author of the new book, If We Can Keep It, How the Republic Collapsed, How It Might Be Saved. Real study of how we got to our polarized politics today. Great book, Michael. Uh, but let's begin with the week. Uh, Matthew, you look, at the, you look at the week. You look at the Cohen hearing, seven hours on Capitol, the collapse of the North Korea talks. Maggie's story about the security clearance, which we just saw Congressman Nader call an abuse of power. But one big fact that also screams out is that President Trump emerges from this week with his Republican base completely intact. I mean, I think what we're seeing now is because we've been operating in this sort of chaotic environment for two plus years or three years, if you include the campaign and everything that happened in that, I think people at this point in time, the people that are opposed to Donald Trump are solidly opposed to Donald Trump. The people that are for Do Donald Trump are basically solidly for Donald Trump. And all these pieces of information don't change, seem to change that equilibrium. I think the country actually is waiting for, tell us really, give us the story. So give us the Mueller report find something in an investigation that somebody that they find incredibly credible that would which wouldn't be michael cohen even though he raised dr dramatic concerns that i think the congress should investigate but i think we're in this equilibrium place it's fundamentally not going to change until something the american public is presented with where they have a conclusion and, and sarah fagan it was pretty remarkable at the hearing on on wednesday not to see and it was we also saw with congressman mccarthy here today complete focus on michael cohen and his credibility no real concern or even defense of the president's uh, against the charges against the president are there any risks for republicans in 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 walking in lockstep behind president trump i think the only the risk to the extent you know, to Matt's point, if there is some real there there, and, and right now we don't have evidence of collusion, um, most Americans... Well, we are, have Manafort's evidence of collusion. Uh, well, you have Manafort's uh, crimes, but that doesn't necessarily extend to the president. And we'll see what the Mueller report says, but one would think after, you know, a year plus 18 months, we would see something if it was directly connected to the president by this point. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately uh, about Cohen, you can look around the investigation uh, labyrinth between the Southern District and Mueller and the Congress. Of all the things the Trump White House needs to be concerned about, and there are some real concerns out there, the Cohen testimony wasn't one of them. It, he's just not a credible figure. And only base Democrats found him credible, and they would find him credible no matter what he said at this point, if he was criticizing Donald Trump. I guess the question is going to be what kind of evidence is followed up by other committees. But, Maggie, one of the things I wanted to bring uh, to you is that, you know, a lot of us have been hearing these reports, and, and you don't know how much credence to give them. Oh, the Mueller's going to come out pretty soon, not going to be a big bang there, kind of anticlimactic. One of the mysteries to me watching the president yesterday, he doesn't act like a guy who's expecting welcome news from Robert Mueller. No, although it's hard for me to do much sort of tea leaf reading out of Donald Trump's behavior because he often forecasts negatives that aren't there either. But he absolutely is pre-spinning something. That's what that speech was largely about. It was discrediting whatever is going to be coming down the pike. Whether that is going to re relate to Russia directly or some other aspect of his business. Um, but no, he is not saying there's nothing here and there's nothing to worry about and sort of moving on like a happy warrior. Again, psychically, it's hard for me to divorce that from the week he had, right? It might not have anything to do with what he knows It may just there. be habit, too. It might be habit, and it might be... This was, this was one of the worst weeks, if not the worst, of his presidency. You had, on the same day as the Michael Cohen testimony, you had what was happening in Vietnam with his summit with the North Korean leader. Uh, that did not go well, and so I f think he feels like he's fighting this two-pronged front, and yesterday was an attempt to get back. And, and, Tom, you covered President Trump all through the campaign. A lot of what you saw this week must have been familiar to you, particularly that few 
vacuuming uh, against Michael Cohen, who for so long, uh, they, they had a you know, contentious at times relationship, but very close as well. Right. And I, I agree with Maggie, but I also think any time President Trump gives one of these long speeches, and this was the longest of his presidency, two hours, he clearly is trying to make a point. So I agree with Maggie, but I also think he was trying to wrestle back the headlines. Remember, he, he, was, he was in Vietnam on the cover front pages across the world, but so was Michael Cohen. He also had that failed summit in North Korea. And again, he was talking to CPAC. He was talking to his crowd. He was trying to amp him up. And by the end of it, he had turned that into a campaign speech. I agree with Maggie. He may possibly be worried about something, but again, he's trying to wrestle back those headlines. And, and Michael, as I said, your book goes a long way to explaining the kind of polarization we see today. We see both parties playing it out. So talk a little bit about the risk that I brought up with Sarah Fagan of the, uh, of the Republicans running in lockstep with the president. Also, the Democrats overreaching on impeachment, which uh, Congressman Nadler seemed at times to be sensitive to in the interview today. Uh, I think he was quite sensitive to it. And I think, I think he said the right thing. I think he said that, you know, they can't get too, out, too far out in front of public opinion uh, when it comes to the issue of impeachment. They can't seem to Republicans like they're trying to nullify the results of the last election. He denied to you that it was political, but uh, there's nothing wrong with being a little bit political about this. This is politics. It's okay to be a little bit political. Yes, they have to follow the rule of law and they have to do the right thing according to the law. And if the president obstructed justice, merely obstructing justice, we, we forget about obstruction of justice sometimes and we, when we talk about collusion. Obstruction of justice is a real thing. It's an impeachable offense. But. He's right that they can't get too far out in front of public opinion on this. They have to bring public opinion along if, if that's where they're going to go. But it was stunning to me to listen to the congressman say that he has absolutely obstructed justice when Congress has had but a few hearings. He has made up his mind already. And the Democrats are going to look for as long as they are able until they find something. That they uh, that they view as obstruction of justice. Well, that is not a that's not the honest well, a, way to approach. There's a fair it. amount of well, evidence it, already. Yeah. Un, but un, the, un so you, you one could make that argument, but you could also make that argument the majority of the country has made up their mind about the president. You could also make the argument the majority of Republicans have made up their mind that he's done nothing wrong because they're unwilling to castigate him for that. I think the problem for the Republicans in this is that we ran a test case of what it's like to be running with this president in 2018 at the same level of approval ratings he has today. And that test well, case... approval rating is kind of climbing a little bit. 46% of the new NBC polls. Which is where he was on a like, which is where he was right before the midterms, which is where he was on inauguration day. And when the elections were held in November 2018, Democrats had an historic election advantage. They won by 10 million votes. And so if we run this out, the problem that for the president isn't that his, what his number is. The problem is, is he's uncon he has not convinced a majority of the country ever in his presidency to support it. And the other question is what else we learn as we go along through these investigations. And Maggie, you had this piece about the security clearances this week in Jared Kushner. And this remarkable uh, video of the president uh, during your interview simply saying, I didn't get involved at, at all. Try, try and bring us inside the room uh, when that happens. Do you think he knows exactly what you're talking about and knows exactly what he's saying, aware of all the details, and knowing how much vulnerability he could have in the future? It's always hard to know exactly how, how aware he is of sort of future dangers, right? I mean, he tends to sort of exist in 10 minute increments of time and he says what he has to say. I asked the question because we had been pursuing this tip that uh, there was this memo, this Kelly memo that existed. John Kelly, the White House Chief of Staff. Correct, who, uh, that he was directed or ordered to give this clearance to Jared Kushner by the president, again, within the president's authority. And so when I asked him the question, honestly, George, I thought he was going to say yes. And then I thought I was going to go back and write a story about how this clearance had come about. I uh, have the right to do it? Right. And, and sure, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. And instead he said no, and I don't think I have the authority to do that. And I was surprised. And I, I'm not usually surprised in these, in these discussions with him, but I was there because I thought he was just going to lean into what he could do. I don't know what the language was between him and John Kelly. I don't know what the specifics of the conversation were. I think only the two of them do. Uh, could it be some situation where he said, just deal with it, and John Kelly took that as an order? Or, you know, did John Kelly press him and say, is that an order? And the president says, yes, we don't know. One of the things that's clear, Tommy, on my story, it seems to be clear, if Jer Jerry Nadler follows through on his request for, what, 60 uh, document requests starting uh, tomorrow, is that a lot of this information is either going to get locked up in the courts or we're going to see it trickling out. Over the next year. Over the next two years, possibly. But what I got from Jerry Nadler's interview was, what is the North Star? If it's no longer the Mueller report, if it's not collusion, he mentioned abuse of power, obstruction, where do Democrats go? And are any of those investigations big enough 
to take down the president? I don't know about taking down the president, but when you lay out everything they had there, emoluments, violations, they're going to look at his tax returns, potential abuse of power, obstruction of justice, it does seem like we have uh, quite a year. Yeah. Well, I actually don't think it's benefit, it doesn't necessarily benefit Democrats to impeach the president politically. That's not necessarily... Well, but it, then that's, that's actually one of the questions I wanted to get to, though, and <laughs> we're running over time now, but <laughs> is, is it possible that we're seeing an emerging Democratic strategy that you simply keep on doing the investigations and never reach the actual question of whether to open up impeachment. I think that depends on the evidence. Yeah. But, but I think it's much better for the Democrats if they don't get to the final but, stage of but impeachment. What is the point of that? I mean, the point of it is just politics. And, you know, if they have direct evidence to implicate the president or someone around him, they should, they should go there. But for them to go down a road where they have no end game. Uh, seems like it's very disruptive to the well, I think if you have a president who has uh, broken the law, as Michael Cohen alleges, we don't know that, but he says that, and a president who has obstructed justice, which it seems to me he's done on national television and in front of our faces and on Twitter many times, uh, uh, there's a point to bringing all that out. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.